Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about kinematics terms and the equations of motion. So what is kinematics? Kinematics is the study of motion. So let's differentiate between what a scalar is and what a vector is, because these will be very important in kinematic equations. Scalars are things that only have a magnitude. And this includes measurements like distance, time, and speed. On the other hand, a vector has both a magnitude and a direction. And this includes measurements like velocity, position, displacement, and acceleration. So what is velocity? Velocity is actually equal to the change in position over the change in time. Whereas acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over change in time. Now, this may be confusing at first, however, it will become much more clear when we go over the motion graphs that I will be discussing later on. So, let's just do a visual representation of what position is. So, if you think about it, if a person starts here and they walk along this path, let's say this distance is d. So, if they walked from this point to this point and they made a loop, that means they walked two times that distance. However, if you were talking in terms of vectors, you would say that the displacement is actually zero. Now, the displacement is the change in position. And if you look at where the person started and where he ended, it'd be at the same point. Therefore, the displacement is zero because the change in position is zero. Now, let's just talk about this. So there's a change in time, which means this is an average. However, there are also instantaneous measurements. So an average is a measurement that's taken over a certain time interval, such as the definitions that I've given up here, whereas instantaneous would be a measurement at a specific point in time. Now, this relates to the secant of a graph, whereas this relates to the tangent. If we draw out three graphs for comparison, Let's say this is position over time, and this is velocity over time, and this is acceleration over time. And this person walked something like this. So this would mean that their position didn't change at all during this point. They moved away from the reference point, but then again, they stopped. So what does that mean? In terms of velocity, this would mean that your velocity was zero for this point, because you did not move away from your reference point this would be zero. Now, if you look here, you're walking away from your reference point, which means your velocity must have been at a constant because it is a straight line. So this would be something like that. And again here, you're not moving. So it would go back to zero because if we look back at the definition of velocity, it's the change in displacement over change in time. And displacement is the change in position. For this example, acceleration would be zero all throughout. Why, you ask? Because acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. But if you look at all of these intervals, velocity is constant. Okay, so let's do a different example where you have an acceleration. So again, here's a distance time plot. And let's say your graph is something like this. Now, how would you do the velocity for that? Well, if you look here, you can see that you're traveling more distance away from your reference point as time goes along. Your velocity is actually increasing because you're having an acceleration. So your velocity here would go from zero, as we're assuming it started from rest, and it would increase, which would mean you would have an acceleration in the positive region. Now if you continue this graph, the distance slows down and eventually reaches zero at the max because you're changing directions back down. So if you look at that, let's say it's constant for this time, and then it slows down back to zero, and then since it's changing directions and moving back towards the reference point, that would be a negative acceleration. And as you can see, it's getting steeper and steeper, which again means your velocity is increasing, but in the negative region. And there's no such thing as positive and negative. These simply refer to the direction. So I just allowed the positive to be moving away from the reference point, whereas the negative is moving back towards it. Now continuing our acceleration time graph, you can see that at this point, similar to this case, the acceleration is zero because your velocity is constant. However, over here, 
when you're having a negative velocity means that you're speeding up but moving towards the reference point. You have a negative acceleration. Now, if we actually analyze these motion graphs, you'll realize that the slope on the position time graph is actually d2 minus c1 over t2 minus t1, also known as secant. That gives you your velocity, which is anything here. Whereas your slope on the velocity graph is actually your acceleration, which is zero. And similarly, if you go backwards, the area under is representative of your velocity. Whereas the area under the velocity time graph will be representative of the change in position during that time period. Let's say this is your displacement time graph again. So you're trying to find the secant between two points. You'll see that this whole path is actually ignored because displacement is independent of the path taken. So let's say this was 5, 3, and this was 3, 1. So to take that slope, it'd be 3 minus 1 because y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, so that'd be 2 over 2, which is 1. I forgot to mention this, but this would be in meters and this would be in seconds, therefore meters per second. And as I was saying before, the slope is equal to the velocity, which makes sense because these units correspond with the velocity. What if you wanted the instantaneous velocity? How would you calculate that? It's the tangent, as I mentioned before. So the tangent only touches the point at the time which you're taking the velocity of. And then you would just draw a little triangle. Usually this would be done on graph paper. And you would take the height and the width. And you would just simply do the slope calculation with the change in height over change in width. And then you would get a certain number here. So now that we know what acceleration is, what velocity, displacement, position, and distance, time, and speed are, we can actually talk about the big five equations. So there's five equations in kinematics that are going to be the most useful when acceleration is constant. And these can be manipulated to solve for different variables. So starting off with the first one, so the displacement is equal to the average velocity, and if you think about it, the average would just be the sum divided by the number of terms you're adding, which would be 2, so that's where that comes from, times the time. And the variable that's not in this equation is acceleration. So if you were not given acceleration, you just need one of these to be your unknown, and if you have all the other information, then you can isolate for this, and then plug in numbers and get your answer. Now this is the only equation that actually does not have any arrows, meaning there's no vector notation. And the reason for this is actually because anytime you take the square of something, you're getting rid of the direction, because square of anything gives you a positive number. So even if it was a negative direction than the one you were using as your reference, it would still come out positive. So there's no direction associated with equation number four. Now let's actually try solving some problems. So let's start off with a question from Nelson 1.1. So if you have the textbook, this is actually page 16. So it's saying that an airplane flies at 450 kilometers for 45 minutes. And the direction, which means it's a velocity, is at a heading of 85. So what does heading actually mean? If you were to have your compass, north, east, south, west, a heading of 85 would be something like this. So it's relative to the north. So this is 85 degrees. So what does that mean? That means it's either north 85 degrees east, or you could equivalently say east 5 degrees north. So how you do that is since this is a 90 degree angle, you would just do 90 degrees minus the alternate angle that you found. So 85, which would give you 5. Okay, so A asks us to find the airplane's average speed. So you can actually use either one of these equations, since speed is being constant all throughout. And since you have zero acceleration, you'll see that your equation is just D is equal to VT. So rearranging to find V, it'd just be D over T. And you notice here that they didn't give you SI units. So you'll have to convert first. 450 kilometers in 45 minutes and you just perform factor label method so 1000 meters in one kilometer make sure the units are top and bottom so they cancel 
and one minute is 60 seconds and then cancel 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 and you're left with meters per second and when you calculate this with the appropriate sig fix it should give you 170 meters per second as you can notice here there are two sig figs in your initial givens next it's asking you in b to solve for the average velocity now since your airplane is traveling the same direction all throughout the flight this is actually your final direction so the only difference here is that instead of distance over time it's displacement over time your displacement is 450 kilometers north 85 degrees east and then you just actually repeat the same process as you did above with the factor label method and you would get 170 meters per second but with a direction this time okay so now we're gonna end off with page 21 number three it says that officer at rest notices a speeder moving at 62 kilometers per hour when the speeder passes the officer accelerates at three meters per second squared in pursuit the speeder doesn't notice until the officer catches up so what are you given here? You're given that the police officer starts at rest. So his initial velocity would be zero. The acceleration over here would be three meters per second squared. And since we're working with SI units and you're given that the speeder is moving at 62 kilometers per hour, you have to perform factor label method here. And again, make sure that your units can cancel top and bottom and you get that the speeder was moving at 17.223 meters per second. Now here, you let a certain direction be positive because then you can get rid of vector notation and it's much more simple. Question A asks, how long will it take for the officer to catch the speeder? So in order to solve for time, you have the two equations that describe the displacement of the speeder and the police officer and you can let them equal each other and you solve for t. So when you isolate for t, you'll find something like this. So t0 is the first time they meet, which is when the speeder first passes by the officer, and t2 is the time you actually want. So because of sig figs, referring back to the question, you see there were two sig figs, so it was 11 seconds. In question b, it asks how far will they move from the position where the officer was at rest? So over here, you're solving for displacement. So again, using that formula, you just sub the numbers in, and then you would get that their displacement was 200 meters when using appropriate sig figs. So since it's a displacement, you have to include a direction. And since it's a positive, we know that it's forward since we let forward be positive. In C, it asks, calculate the speed of the police car when the officer catches the speeder. Is this reasonable? So you're solving for final speed. And using one of the big five equations again, you can cancel out V1 because the officer started at rest. And using factor label method, you would find that his speed was 122.4 kilometers per hour. So no, it's not reasonable because this is a very high speed. Now in D, it asks, now assume that the police officer accelerates until the police car is moving 10 kilometers per hour faster than the speeder and then moves at a constant velocity. How long will it take to catch the speeder? And is this scenario more reasonable than the scenario in C? So over here, you're given that the final velocity of the police officer is 10 kilometers more than the speed of the speeder. So that gives you 72 kilometers per hour. And then when you convert it, 20 meters per second. Also remember that the officer starts at rest. So his initial velocity was 0 meters per second. And then his acceleration was 3 meters per second squared. Solving for t once again, you just sub the numbers in, cancel out v1, and you get 6.7 seconds. And yes, this is more reasonable because it was only driving at 72 kilometers per hour versus 122.4. So that wraps up our first lesson about kinematics terms and the equations of motion. Tune in next time to learn about displacement, velocity, and acceleration in two dimensions.